Welcome to the Political Trenches, local government at work, the show that delves into the municipal stories that are making the headlines from across Canada. Today, we're heading to the land of the living skies in the province of Saskatchewan. But before we do that, we have big stories to dive into. So brace yourself for today's municipal roller coaster ride. Ian, seriously, it feels like we just blinked and boom, we're already five months deep into 2024. How's May chalking up for you so far? I guess it is five months. May is coming good. We're starting to head into conference season. Although I don't think we ever really finished conference season because it seems coast to coast to coast. There's always a conference going on somewhere. But I think with some of the Alberta conferences and national conferences that are coming up, we're starting to see that really ramp up as well. So those are always so fun you, to get together with people. So you've been busy, busy, busy? I've been busy, busy, busy. Uh, well, mm-hmm. you probably ask me this every time. And I probably respond the same way every time. But the busy in which is, is often defined slightly differently. But yeah, it's been busy. Awesome. So let's dive into the top stories of the week, uh, last two weeks, I should say. But in the wake of the significant backlash from mayors and councillors across Alberta, the province is promising amendments to the proposed legislation to give itself major new powers over municipalities. In a statement last Thursday, Municipal Affairs Minister Rick McIver said he's planning to work with municipalities to gauge their concerns about the legislation and that amendments will be made to the proposed bill. Introduced in the legislature a week before, Bill 20 would give the Alberta cabinet the power to dismiss councillors and mayors in any municipality and to repeal and amend local municipal bylaws. The legislation would also allow for the creation of municipal political parties in Edmonton and Calgary as a pilot project. Now, the bill, the Municipal Affairs Statute Amendments Act of 2024, would amend both the Local Authorities Election Act and the Municipal Government Act. Both Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta have both come out in opposition to major parts of the bill. Ian, now I was not going to lead off with this story, but over the last two days, my social media has been blowing up with mayors and councillors from across Canada asking what the hell is going on in Alberta. So we need to dissect what this is all about. So I got to start off with a simple question, but an important one. What do you see in your opinion as the fundamental flaw of Bill 20? Well, I think there's a structural flaw in terms of process. And this is a case of the Alberta government doing a ready, fire, aim. In that they've come out with legislation, not done any consultation about it, and been forced to retract, if not retract, then retract and retench a little bit and say they will do consultation which seems like a pretty disingenuous uh, offer at this point. The other, of course, is to the contents of the bill. You've recognized that some of the big pieces are repealing bylaws, uh, potentially removing elected officials. Um, hard, we're talking about parties in Edmonton and Calgary and a whole suite of other things that are showing up in this bylaw. There, I mean, uh, sorry, in this uh, this bill, there are certainly some good parts to it as well, but I would say that based on what we have heard, the bad vastly outweighs the good in terms of what Albertans have said they want and what local governments are saying they're hearing from their people and what they think ought to, ought to happen as well. Now, I, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Minister of Municipal Affairs, Rick McIver, for our sister show, Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. And I talked about sort of the what, what's this bill trying to solve? And he gave a very long answer, but in the short form of it, basically, it's it's trying to expedite the process that is already in place. His words, not mine, but his words. It's trying to speed up this process, but also allow the cabinet to remove a counselor that usually takes six months to only take one month or repeal a bylaw that the province doesn't believe is right in the middle of the summer when the legislature is not sitting and it would not cost as uh, as much money to bring in the legislature and potentially repeal that municipal bylaw. Is that a leg to stand on in this case? Sounds like lipstick on a pig to me. Uh, no, okay, I don't. Sarah I don't this. <laughs> this is, uh, this is overreach to me. This is the government of Alberta saying it wants to do to what municipalities what it doesn't want the federal government to do to it. Now, I, while I have been mentioning this a bunch of times over the last few weeks, I've had more than one or two people say to me, well, local governments are under the control of the under provincial governments under the Canadian Constitution, which is, of course, correct. But to me, there's this is a letter of the law, spirit of the law thing that's going on here. It's solving a problem that doesn't really exist. 
use another metaphor. It's using a sledgehammer to kill a fly. There's all kinds of little metaphors that we can use um, that just aren't uh, aren't appropriate. So that these bills aren't wanted, aren't necessary, aren't appropriate. That they, in fact, already cover uh, authority that the province has. When you start to look at the, the rules of things like legislative paramountcy, which is a bylaw can't contradict a uh, provincial act, a provincial act can't contradict the count, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, unless you use word notwithstanding, which is showing up. So to me, the it, these most of what's not in here, sorry, what most of what's in here isn't necessary. So I don't, on balance, I think it's just a, it's a, it's been a waste of effort, and I think it's built a whole lot more bad blood. It's created a ton more potential for red tape. And I think it's doing everything that the provincial government has said they don't want to do, creating more government, more red tape, all of those sorts. I am not a fan of this at all. So the, you bring up the Constitution, and I, I do want to make a little plug here, because uh, some of these conversations that I've been having on social media behind the scenes, uh, there's one in particular, and I even mentioned it to Minister McIver when I've had him on the show, that you talk about what Trudeau is doing to the provinces, the prime minister is doing to the provinces is akin to what is happening with this bill to the municipalities. And one councillor in particular in here in Alberta messaged me the day this came out and said, when can we start having conversations about introducing the municipalities into the constitution to get mm -hmm. out from behind that provincial overreach and that provincial cre that, that saying old saying that cr we are the creature of the province. Um, this is not an Alberta issue right now because uh, when I was in Saskatchewan, bill 18 was brought up and people were asking me, we could potentially see that here in Saskatchewan after the next provincial election. Bill 20, I've had a few mayors and councillors from Saskatchewan say, is what happening in Alberta going to be happening in Saskatchewan? Is this a bigger conversation that municipalities across Canada need to start having about potentially entrenching themselves into the Constitution? Or am I just out to left field here? I don't think you're out to left field, Chris, but opening up the Constitution for a particular reason is a little like opening Pandora's box. We have no idea what else is going to come out of it unintentionally. So I would doubt that anybody is really desirous of trying to open the Constitution or amend the Constitution for a single reason. Not only that, but we have a bulk of the provinces uh, in terms of population, maybe Alberta, Saskatchewan, Ontario, and maybe a couple of others who are putting putting their fingers into local governments. And I highly doubt they would be interested in changing any of the rules that would benefit local governments when they have them under control. You look at pl even places like New Brunswick, which last year went through a very major restructuring program. I'm not even sure municipal restructuring program. I'm not even sure that they would want to change the rules because then it would have made it much, much harder for them to do what they do. Harkening back a decade or so, Manitoba did something similar. So at, uh, all at some point, most provinces are making changes to their municipal structures in response to something. And I kind of doubt that they would want the, the municipal governments to be an order of government in the same way the federal and provincial orders of government exist. So just before we move on to uh, story two here, I do want to mention that we are recording this on Monday, May 6th. Later on this week, we are anticipating this bill to be read the first time in the legislature in Alberta. So uh, as of the schedule, it's supposed to be read this week, but the amendments are going to be taking place. So we're not sure if that's going to change. But as of right now, at Monday, May 6th, that is still going ahead, but that could change. So if you listen to this on Wednesday when we air, please note that that could have changed by the time this has been recorded to the time it has aired. So going into story two now, the Quebec government plans to curb the often toxic climate that drives out local politicians and is being welcomed by Montreal area mayors who have long called for change. Longwell Mayor Catherine Fournier has was placed under intermittent police protection last year and has received death threats over a years-long controversial plan to call local deer. Her predecessor was also the target of threats in 2020. Bill 57, which was tabled at the provincial legislature in April, poses stiff punitive measures for people who harass elected officials in Quebec. It comes as hundreds have left municipal jobs since the 2021 municipal elections in the province. Now, if the proposed legislation becomes law, people who harass or threaten politicians could face a court injunction 
or a fine up to $1,500. It would also give police the power to impose a fine ranging from $50 to $500 on any person who disrupts a city council meeting with disorderly conduct. Now, Ian, you are in the process of writing a book about abuse in local government. When speaking with municipal leaders from all corners of Canada, are you or have you heard that the provincial government needs to step into this arena to help solve the abuse in local governments that um, abuse abuse that local government officials are being faced with? Well, if you, if we look at the politicians, I think the federal government, the provincial government, politicians are a big part of the problem. Actually, last week, for example, we heard uh, the leader of the um, Conservative Party calling the, the Prime Minister wacko in the House of Commons. I mean, on the surface, not a not a not a terrible thing to say, but certainly unparliamentary and something that was repeated time and time again by many of his MPs outside the House of Commons. So there are certain this is certainly something that is being fed by other orders of government. There certainly are things that government can do about it. But when you look at fines and things like that, what we're doing, those are essentially dealing, still dealing with the effects rather than the causes. Until we get upstream of it, we're not really going to see much, much of an effect. We could change the fine to $3,000 or $10,000. It's going to dissuade some people potentially, but if this is a passion thing, a lot of people aren't going to be dissuaded by this either. So sure, this is part, one of the tools, if you like, that we could use, but there are so many others as well. And the stories like this, particularly to do with Longueuil, but other places in Quebec and elsewhere across the country are not are, are becoming more and more common. The, the impacts are becoming more and more severe as what was considered to be taboo five years ago is now just normal course of business. Who knows what's going to happen in the next two or three years? And we're, 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 we're building an us versus them climate where us is a small group of people, them is everybody else, and we can deride each other just based on the fact they're not part of our own group. So government can be part of the solution, but it has to stop creating the problem as well. So uh, I, I often do this on the show, so this is no exception, but I'm going to play a little bit of devil's advocate with you for a second here, Ian. Abuse can encompass a range of issues and can be subjective to the person the abuse is aimed at. Can a provincial government legislate abuse and fine people for abuse if what the abuse is can differ from every different person in Canada? Yeah, uh, they can. They managed to do it in terms of things like hate speech now, which to me is, is a form but of is verbal. it right? I think it's got to be done. I think they've got to do an attempt to. Your comment about perception is an interesting one because I've actually, during the course of interviews for this book, I've spoken with lots and lots of people who claim to have been uh, victims of uncivil behavior or abuse, whatever the case may be. The stories are all different, but they're all severe to the person who received it as a victim. And lots of people have said to me, you know what, I've been told I should have a thicker skin. I don't think that's correct. I, everybody has to have a, a skin that is thick enough to deal with the thrust and parry of political decision making. But not if we're starting to have see kids getting involved. We're starting to see harassment at grocery stores and restaurants beginning to happen. A lot of what's happening online through social media and even some mainstream media, populism, things that got worse through COVID and a whole bunch of other things that are recent changes to society that government is just trying to catch up with by putting their thumbs in the holes, many, many holes and a growing number of holes in the dike of civility. So I'm going to turn to our last subject here, and the voters in Black River, Matherson, Ontario, will go to the polls on August 12th to pick a new mayor and entire town council. After the Ontario Ministry of Municipal Affairs removed the entire council for failing to meet over the last two months. Now, a single provincial staffer based out of the ministry's Sudbury office is now playing the role of mayor and council until the by-election this summer, including presiding over council meetings and deciding on the town's budget, which is currently in the works. Now, on Monday of last week, the provincial government announced that it was vacating Black River Matheson's Council because it failed to hold a meeting for more than 60 days. Quote, the decision of meeting impedes decision making and negatively affects local residents, end quote, wrote the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing Paul Calander in a letter to the six councillors and Mayor Doug Bender. Calander was able to disband council thanks to Section 2661 of the Municipal Act, which gives him the power to vacate council seats if they are unable 
unable to perform their duties. Last year, Black River Matheson's council approved a 34% property tax hike without public consultation. Now, the mayor of the now the former mayor of the township said that he had no choice but to raise taxes. Quote, municipalities are required to balance their budget. Previous councils have been taking money from reserves. Taking money from reserves means that you have less investment income coming in to help offset current budget requirements, end quote. But that decision upset some residents and councillors. Now, in October of 2023, 14 municipal workers were locked out and later went on strike. The labour issues still, as of recording, have not been resolved. Because of those issues, a group of three councillor members stopped attending meetings requesting the province step in and solve the issue. In late April, the province, the provincial government announced it was vacating the entire council because it failed to hold the meetings. Now, the ministry did provide a statement to CBC saying that the last time this power to vacate the entire council was used was back in 1993 in the province of Ontario. Ian, we have we have seen here in Alberta the Minister of Municipal Affairs fire some members of council or a mayor, but not, in my mind or my current research, an entire council. Did the province do the right thing here in stepping in to vacate the entire council when they were failing to do their job by not meeting to govern the municipality? Yeah, I think they actually did in this case. But if the if the local government, for whatever reason, isn't doing the job it was elected to do, then somebody has to do that. The province, in this case, has appointed essentially an overseer until the by-election can be held and council can come back into having a quorum. This council, to the best of my knowledge, was acclaimed. So there was nobody who ran in the Ontario election in 2022. Sorry, not nobody who ran. There was no, there was no competition for these seats. And sometimes smaller communities, people think council's just kind of for fun. It's not. If everything is easy, then council doesn't really need to be there. If it becomes difficult, then they do. And this is one of those cases where it seemed that council was difficult because what they thought of was imprudent uh, governance from previous councils i.e. spending reserves rather than bringing in the revenue necessary to cover costs, was bound to create a problem at some time in the future. So those chickens have come home to roost. We've seen that other way, other places in Canada with things like um, uh, infrastructure upgrades that are required or huge infrastructure deficits that it's coming more and more and more. In this case, I'm not sure what it was with council that they chosen not to act on this because of what they were getting from the community. So we can kind of harken back to our first story about the role of the province and the second story about uh, dealing with abuse and roll it together here and say both sides probably came to play in this story. Ideally, once the new council is is in place for the for the duration of this term, the administrator can go back to doing in a, a provincial job and the municipality can look after itself and seek its own uh, own interests over the long term. So hopefully, I think I think the province did what they had to do, not necessarily what they wanted to do. But in this case, it's probably the right choice. It, it looks that way from my standpoint. So we'll be right back after a quick break with the CEO of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association, John Mark Nadu. Welcome to the Political Trenches, Local Government at Work. Our guest today is John Mark Nadeau, CEO of the Saskatchewan Urban Municipality Association. Now, at the turn of the century, the local city, town, and village governments of Saskatchewan believed it was necessary to have an organization though, through which they could, on a collective basis, express their needs and desires for legislative and financial services to the provincial government. Now, in 1906, the Union of Saskatchewan Municipalities, the name would later change to SUMA, held their first convention. Since then, SUMA has been the collective voice for Saskatchewan municipalities representing the interest of municipal governments on policy and programs matters within the provincial jurisdiction. John Mark Nadeau has been the CEO of SUMA since 2017, previously serving as the city of manager for the city of Portage la Prairie, Manitoba. He has also worked in various roles in the RCMP in Ottawa, Manitoba, Northern BC, the Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. He also served overseas as a senior rule of law advisor in Afghanistan with NATO. With that, John Mark, welcome to the political trenches. Well, thank you very much, Chris, and good afternoon, Ian. Good to see you guys. See you too, John. So to kick off the interview, a simple question for you here. 
What do you believe is the state of municipalities in Saskatchewan today? Well, Chris, uh, municipalities are um, all in all quite a well positioned. Um, I mean, they have to provide balanced budgets. So uh, in the short term, they are viable and they're doing really well, thriving. I think there's some uh, challenges with uh, some of the economic development uh, initiatives that are, um, you know, the broadband's an issue, for example. Coming out of uh, of the COVID uh, pandemic, we saw that um, people can work from home. And um, so that is a good omen for some of those smaller communities to attract and retain uh, employees. I, for example, one of my colleague works uh, not in Regina and, and has access to broadband and it's, and it's fine. It's when you get into the smaller uh, units uh, in the province that we're going to see some challenges. And uh, one of the challenge, one of the work that we're doing with Suma is around broadband, and, and hopefully that's going to uh, lead to uh, significantly better broadband across the province. Well, you made a reference, as uh, to the election that's coming up this fall, and you you made a comment about broadband, for example. What sort of uh, issues do you think are starting to bubble up, if any, in terms of local election issues around the province? If there's anything that is consistent. Well, I think uh, our one of our cornerstone uh, advocacy file is mental health and addiction, and and we applauded uh, several times the province with uh, some of their investments around expansion of uh, treatment beds and and so on. But um, at the end of the day, the what remains to be dealt with is the entire uh, uh, service and support to those that have mental health and addiction issues. Uh, it's fine to provide them a bed. Um, and, and as Chris mentioned in the opening, my background being in policing, uh, I've seen it throughout my career. Um, you bring somebody for some addiction treatment and 28 days is not enough, we know that. Um, and what happens when they're uh, back on the street, they go back to their old habits, right? The definition of insanity doing the same thing over and over and expect different results. Mm -hmm. So um, the issues that we are going to be advocating during the uh, provincial elections coming up is further investments by the province to help um, deal with the mental health and addiction issues in the province. And it doesn't affect just the, the larger urbans. We see it, homelessness in Regina, encampments that we dealt with now two summers in a row. Um, we're seeing it in smaller urbans as well, the Nakims of the world and the, you know, and, I, and I'm just picking a name. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there's necessarily an issue in Nakim, but those smaller urbans are also seeing mental health and addiction issues, couch surfing, um, people using the public uh, washrooms at the rink to uh, wash themselves because they have nowhere else to go. Um, and, and we're seeing that. So um we need to as a as a province we need to see more investments in support for mental health and addictions not just 28 day um treatment beds that they've announced which is awesome um and also with respect to public housing there's a large number of vacant um public housing in Saskatchewan and uh we need to find ways to uh allow the rules to change so that people can uh, use those. Um, and, uh, and you know, those will be some of the higher topics that we're going to be advocating during the camping. 450, hypothetically, municipalities in the province of Saskatchewan. Can you name all of them? Can you literally say that you, like, you know people from every single, and I'm not trying to be rude about that. It's just, that's a lot of diverse voices at the table. And I know your board of governors. I've met with uh, President Golden on numerous occasions. I've sat down with many of your board of directors on our show, the Cross Border Interviews. And it seems like there's a lot of diverse voices at that table and diverse voices across the province from all the way from Stony Rapids down to Macon, over to Maple Ridge, to Yorkton, across across the gambit how does suma advocate for such a diverse population when it comes to 440 450 voices trying to advocate for their own unique municipal needs 
Well, that's a, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, one that I struggled with when I first started at SUMA. If, if I were uh, to talk about what my thought pattern was six years ago, I would have told you that's insane. Having come out of Manitoba's forced amalgamation in 2013, I would have said in 2017 in Saskatchewan, 400 and what municipalities? That's crazy. However, I have visited 150 communities so far. Uh, COVID um, affected my ability to travel, uh, and I'm hoping to resume that um, probably not this summer, but certainly the summer uh, next year. The fact that I was able to sit in those communities, even if it's just an hour, and sit down with the mayor and council or, or the CAO or both and speak to them about their issues in their backyard, um, that was hugely informative for me as my sort of um, learning about the municipal, the municipal world in Saskatchewan. Having said that, and you, Chris, you know that because you were at our convention in April, we have just uh, had the membership approve a change of governance at SUMA, um, a governance that's been in place since 1905. Uh, essentially, which was um, more or less of a regional representation with some sectoral, peppered with sectoral um, uh, discussions. We're moving to a caucus-based model where the towns will get together and discuss town-related issues, villages, the same, and the cities, the same. And, and we feel that that is going to provide us with a much more focused approach to our advocacy and hearing out the different sector issues. Um, um, and I'm quite frankly, quite uh, excited about that. Uh, looking forward to uh, our new governance being in place next year. And, uh, and, and we'll do a review in three years after that. But uh, I'm quite confident that that, was, that is going to give us a better ability to hear the concerns and not have the, the village issue drowned out by the cities, which um, I can tell you that has never happened in my time. Uh, I don't know about the past, but there's this perception out there that villages issues get drowned out by the cities or vice versa. Um, and, and that, uh, I think, will resolve that with the new caucus model. Because we, this podcast or webcast or however you listen to it, it goes coast to coast and more broadly than that, there are some things that are unique about how local government, well, local government structures and how things operate in local government in Saskatchewan. Do you want to point, can you point some of those out for people who may not be familiar with how things work in Saskatchewan? Um, well, we have, um, we have three municipal act, if you will, in Saskatchewan. Um, the cities, 16 of them fall under one uh, cities act the uh, the bulk of the municipalities, both the rural municipalities as well as the, as the smaller urbans fall under what we call the Municipal Act of 2010. And then the northern municipalities fall under uh, uh, their own northern act. Um, by and large, all the municip all the acts are fairly similar. Um, although the cities have greater flexibility when it comes to property tax and assessment. Um, speaking of assessment, we have in Saskatchewan um, a uh, association that's responsible for providing uh, property assessment to most of the municipalities. The Saskatchewan Assessment Management Agency, uh, they provide assessment to most municipalities. The larger ones, Saskatoon, Regina, etc., have their own departments, but otherwise they rely on SAMA to provide the assessment. Um, that's different from um, some of the other jurisdictions. And again, go back to the number of municipalities. We have 1.2 million population in Saskatchewan, 775 municipalities. Um, go figure. It, you know, there's a, there's a lot of governance. <laughs> Having said that, um, I went into this job with, again, oh my God, there's a lot of governance. But now that I have been here for, for uh, some time and have done a lot of, you know, quite a bit of research and, and literature review around amalgamation, what's good, what's bad, you know, um, bigger is not always better. 
And um, I think it needs to be, um, you know, if there's going to be any rationalization of the sector, it's got to be done with the local um, the local perspective in mind, not just a forced amalgamation like uh, Manitoba in 2013. Right. Or New Brunswick last year. Yeah, that's right. The, or yep, or Quebec, in, Quebec in 2002 or Ontario in the late 90s, you know, I think... I think the the interesting approach to uh, British Columbia was interesting under uh, Premier um, Campbell. He came at it because he was a, a city manager, or um, sorry, city councillor in Vancouver. Came at it from a let's reinforce the act rather than try to dictate how the sector would be structured. So um, he took a different approach to it. Hmm. With so many municipalities, then I'll just kind of follow this and. Think about you, I suspect you have more municipalities per capita than any other province. How does that affect the viability of a lot of those probably very small municipalities? I have uh, what I I don't have. The province has uh, villages um, that have twenty people in them. So if you got a family of uh, five or six, boy, that affects your uh, your uh, your property uh, revenue, property tax revenue. Um, yeah, I mean, there's 4,400 elected officials in the province. Um, that's huge. Um, they're not going to make, you know, they don't retire on their on their salary, uh, mm -hmm. unlike the federal government when they retire after six years. Um, so they don't, you know, they're not in there to make money. Um, they're there to help their communities. And if there's a pothole, you don't call the premier of the province, you call the mayor of the town or the village. Um uh, so there's, you know, they're paid part time or for attending meetings here and there, but they're on call, you know, basically 24 seven. So, yeah, um, it's a huge commitment. But again, bigger is not always better. And I'm not sure that forcing any sort of amalgamation or or rationalizing the sector uh, wouldn't make a ton of sense because there's such a vast territory to cover and the towns and villages are not close by to you know the the borders are not contiguous so um you know yeah there's 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 some huge challenges with that suma has a big year ahead of itself you're rolling out the we are urban campaign you have a provincial election on the horizon you have a municipal election on the horizon you also have your governance changes that you have to get in place before next april when you meet in saskatoon for the 2025 convention that seems like a tall order is suma up for the task of trying to make sure that everything runs smoothly here and i'm not trying to be rude here but the question is just it seems like it's a very tall order for an organization that represents so many diverse voices to undertake in a year's time and it's our 120th anniversary next year so we're preparing for that as well listen we have a uh, i have a um uh, a team i work with a team that, that extremely effective and efficient um they are motivated uh we're all motivated to serving the members um we have our um our work is cut out for us but we're we've we we created um i call it a war room chris um it's probably not the right word in this context but that's my background so um but we've created a war room and we've got it all laid out the plan and how um, you know, things need to happen and when and, and what are the topics and who are they going to be uh, assigned to and so on and so forth. Um, I've got a lean uh, but mean uh, working machine and we're we're ready to rev and uh, and to get this done. And um, convention is something that happens every year. That group is very well oiled and um um, I'm not worried about that. It's it's going to be the election that's going to be a busy time, and um, and then the governance. It's about putting the policies in place, and I've got some great folks um, on that. And so, yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Awesome, John Mark. I want to thank you from both Ian and myself for joining us in the political trenches today. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, John Mark. Thank you very much for the time, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. I'm sure. 
So our full interview with John Mark will be airing next Wednesday. We'll be right back after a quick break. And Ian, episode about the land of the living skies, beautiful, beautiful Saskatchewan episode is now in the bag. Always a great pleasure to sit down with John Mark, isn't it? It is. I, it's been fun. It's nice to sit down and have a conversation with new people, but it's also kind of nice to have a chat with people we've known for a while as well. And John Mark certainly fits in that category. Exactly. Um, before we go, I was supposed to do this last week, and I apologize for not doing this because we have fans of the show who came up to me at the Association of Manitoba Municipalities Convention in Brandon, Manitoba last April from Lynn Lake, Manitoba. So if you don't know where that municipality is, I highly recommend it because two counselors came up to me and said, hey, we listened to your show. We just want to say thank you so much for doing it. So thank you so much for tuning in. It's always a pleasure to actually hear on the ground when people actually tune in to the shows and actually actually give us their feedback so thank you so much to both you uh, counselor shin and counselor i want to make sure i get this right here because i just edited her interview kenny uh, and kenny thompson thank you so much for tuning in uh, ian what's on the agenda for you for the next two weeks well i'll be pining of course until we get around to recording next time but in between all the pining i think it's actually two weeks of being here relatively there's one very brief trip to saskatchewan one very brief trip to northern Alberta, but other than that, I think I'm hanging around. Well, it's always a pleasure. Well, it's always a pleasure to sit down with you in the political trenches, local government at work, and talk about the municipal issues that are shaping municipalities across Canada. Always a pleasure, Ian. You too. Talk to you soon.